Hello and welcome to Ask GMBN Tech. This is the show where we answer your questions. So if you've got a burning question that you need answered, get in the comments with the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech, and we will do our best to feature it on the show. Onwards, let's get cracking. So straight into it, we have a question from Claudio and they say, they basically looking at their question, they've got some Magrua MT5 brakes, which are you know pretty cool brakes, and they've been bleeding them, but they've been bleeding them with the liquid from their car, which I assume is a clutch or brake fluid, which will be DOT. And as they reference in their question, the Maguras use their royal blood, which is a mineral system. Um, is it good for the brake system? No, it's not. It's going to corrode um, the seals and yeah, just, just get it out of there ASAP. Uh, maybe even speak to Magura about getting some fresh seals in there because they, they have very different properties. A mineral fluid, which is what you know Shimano trick stuff and Magura would use compared to a, um, a dot fluid, which would be you know your SRAM formula. Yeah, the, the dot fluid will corrode the seals if put in a system that is designed specifically for mineral oil. So um, yeah, I'm sorry. Just get that fluid out there ASAP and put some mineral fluid in there. Probably not the answer you wanted, but it's the answer you're gonna get. Next question we have from Fernando Garcia and they say, my bike has a 141 millimeter rear axle and I can't find any wheels or hubs to upgrade my current setup. Is this an odd measurement for the industry? Is it a good or bad type of axle? So let's do some quick math. Ooh, baby. So I'm sure a lot of you can remember, even just a couple of years ago, it was 142 mil by 12 was kind of the standard for your aggressive trail bikes. And the quick release variant was 135 mil. So the flange spacing was the same. Both the disc and chain line sat in the same place. So they were pretty much interchangeable. Now, this is where it's gonna be whew, really exciting and you math nerds best hold up tight, get your calculators out. What is 148 aka boost minus seven is 141. That's where that measurement comes from. It's basically the quick release variation of the 148 times 12 or boost setup that you see very commonly for the rear ends of our mountain bikes. Um, so it's not a good or a bad type of axle. It's just the most common type. Um, in terms of you want to change things, that's where it could get tricky because I don't know if your frame has changeable dropouts where you could install a larger diameter axle. Um, speak to your local bike shop, see if they can help. Next question is from Dennis Rasmussen and he says, can you tell me the difference between the RockShox Yari, Pike and Lyric? They all seem to come with overlapping travel lengths. So this is a really good question. Now, before we talk about these forks in particular, Let's take a similar sort of question and think about our brakes. So for instance, the guide and the code are four pop brakes by these four pistons inside the caliper. But even within that sort of, they're sh although they're sharing that kind of, that similar design space, the application of the two is different. One is kind of more downhill and aggressive. The other is more kind of trail orientated. And it's really similar with our forks. So. There is the Yari, which is actually slightly different to the other two. The Yari is the more kind of budget friendly option of the Lyric. They share the same chassis, but they have different internals. The Lyric and the Pike are now part of SRAM's sort of, or RockShox's signature range. It's called that because it has the Maxima fluid, it has the SKF wiper seals, and it's meant to be kind of a really premium package. I suppose if the Yari is kind of the little sibling of the Lyric, then the Revelation is probably the little sibling of the, uh, the Pike. It's meant to be, they got two different intentions. That burlier Lyric or Yari is meant as your enduro fork. It's meant as hard hitting. Whereas the Pike or the Revelation, yeah, it's more trail conscious. It's, it's made to be lighter. It doesn't have such an emphasis on stiffness. And although there's overlapping travels, that they do that, but so you can fine tune. It's not like, you know, you can get the, you know, if, if you were to buy a bike 
oh, specking up a frame and you wanted 150 mil travel. I think it's great that you can either get the lighter setup or the stiffer setup to suit your needs. And that's all they do it for. So I think it's actually a good thing, although it might seem a bit kind of overly complicated. It's, um, it's basically giving more options to more people. Roger is coming in hot with the next question. He says, can you please explain why people are so obsessed with making their bike as light as possible then to only go and strap water bottles, tools, etc., to it. It seems to me you'd want to carry the weight on your body to keep the weight off your bike, to keep it as nimble and as agile as possible, especially if you spent thousands to make it as light as possible. It's always seemed counterproductive to me. Well, I think you've, at least in my opinion, you've kind of got the wrong end of the stick and you've got it back to front. I would say, if you were pushing a wheelbarrow up the hill and you may as well put your backpack on the, in the wheelbarrow, <laughs> do you know what I mean? If the weight is non-negotiable, if you've got to take it, i.e. a tube, a pump and a multi-tool, in my opinion, it's better to store it on the bike where it is low down than on your person. Um, I absolutely detest riding with a backpack. I just, ugh, it's not for me at all. Um, you know, there's every reason to make your bike as light as possible, which is kind of a different conversation, but if you're to make your bike as light, light as possible, say you get it to 10 kilograms or 12 kilograms or 14 kilograms, that non-negotiable weight we're talking about is gonna be the same regardless. You're gonna need the same tools and the same tube, etc. So um, I think it's good if climbing is important to you to have the lightest setup possible and then just make your piece in any which way you can with, um, with strapping or carrying your stuff. Um, in terms of how nimble the bike is, I would say it depends what that word means to you. I think it's better to have myself sort of nimble, <laughs> feeling free and unrestricted. And with that weight low down, it's the place for it to be, in my opinion. Um, but it's a really, it's quite a divisive issue. Some people really hate not only sort of the concept behind it, but also the aesthetics of strapping and you know getting everything connected to the bike. I am on the other side, I just hate riding with a backpack. Ugh, not for me, but each to their own. Variety is the spice of life. Coming in, coming in with the next question, we got Obadiah Stark, which is a fantastic name. And they say, why do dedicated downhill bikes run such narrow seven speed cassettes? Box Components has made a nine speed cassette with a range of 11 to 50 tooth. Why does something, why not do something similar with a seven speed cassette on a downhill bike, maybe 11 to 40 tooth. Is it really only for clearance? It seems like a very taxing compromise to lo lose that much range for just a few centimeters of clearance. I wouldn't necessarily think it is for clearance. I think what you're trying to achieve by having a close ratio, quite highly geared cassette, is you're gonna give really predictable and accurate shifts between cogs because it's not such a big gap. Um, and you don't need the range of gears because you're predominantly going downhill. You also get lower anti-squat figures running smaller cogs, um, which anti-squat is basically how the suspension and the drivetrain interact with one another, or I suppose how the suspension changes um, with how it responds to accelerations. So it is, there, there would be no sort of benefit for a downhill bike that is being ridden downhill and not in any other kind of variety of riding, you know, not flat, not uphill, just downhill, there wouldn't be really any benefit of having a 40 tooth on the back there. Um, I can't think of the last time I was descending and I thought a 40 tooth would, was anywhere near where I wanted to be. So um, it's a good point you make about clearance, but I don't really think that's what the, um, the issue is because you've got to remember as well, is your mech is sitting there as well. And if, you know, that would be the thing to, to go. Um, but anyway, onwards. Next question is from Dintz, and he says, hello, GMEN team. I wanted to ask you guys if there's any way to replace just my crank arms. You know, he says he's searched on the internet and with just a few results, and they all say he needs to buy a new crank set. Um, for most cranks, you can buy just a left or right-handed arm, um, or a drive side arm. Just talk to your local bike shop. It might not be something that is kind of on shops pages 
but they will probably be able to get them directly through the importer. So um, yeah, I won't worry too much. Talk to your local shop. I think they'll see you right. The next and last question actually is from Aubrey Kuhn and they say, how wide is too wide a wheel size difference for a mullet bike? 69ers are the biggest that most people talk about but what would the ride handling and practical effects be of a say 24 inch or even a 20 inch with a 29 on the front? Um, would the extreme difference in wheel diameters balance out for a nice ride? Um, would that ease of accelerating pushing the 20 inch overcome the mass of the front beast or would it just be annoying and hard to maneuver? I would imagine um, you would probably get something that was, you know those drift trikes, right? It's just like the back end just wants to overtake the front end. I kind of imagine it would be like that in terms and um, that's off no evidence, <laughs> it's just my own thinking. I think, you know, let's think, right, I don't always say it, but with mullet bikes or what mixed wheel bikes, there was a change in the UCI regulation and it allowed for people to explore this avenue. I think that a lot of it was playing catch up with other brands, you know. Sometimes a downhill bike or a trail bike can be in a cycle for four or five years. And if you're a racer, you wanna make improvements quickly. And if that bike isn't to your suiting, then suddenly by putting a 27.5 in the back, you are slackening out the bike, you're getting it as more capable in terms of how aggressive the angles are. So I don't think it's, the, I just don't think it's the golden ticket that people think it is. Maybe when we start seeing production mullet bikes, um, it'll be slightly different, but um, yeah, I just, anyway, I, that's, that's, that's my conjecture. Ignore that, on to your actual question, which is actually what you want to know. Um, I think that having a 20 inch rear wheel with all your weight on it, or a 24 inch, it would just get bogged down in holes. I think it would just, um, I think it'd be quite peculiar to ride and very inconsistent. Um, but phew, who am I to say? How would you, bottom bracket would be a weird height as well. You'd have to do a lot of jiggery pokery to get it anywhere near a sort of rideable state. But um, that's a good question. Good to kind of think outside the box. I don't think it would be that much fun to ride. I think it would, that, you say hard to maneuver. I think it'd probably be a bit too easy to maneuver. And um, especially on, you know, when you're like high, high load through turns, I think um, you'd be coming out of them backwards. But um, that's just me. And there we have it, that is us all wrapped up for this week's show. Now, if you wanna stick with the mullet bikes and see a pretty refined version by people that probably know a lot more about it than I do, click down here for Laurie Greenland's mullet bike. They've actually have got one coming out in production, which is very exciting, so keep your eyes peeled for that. And if you want to maybe kind of look at a Geometry 101 with Doddy, click down there. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe and hit that notification bell, and we will see you next time. Thanks.